1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse number 1. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost parts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which was in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages which, by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other. And the name of one rock, the name of one was Bozes, the name of the other was Sena. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash, the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. This battle that is set in array here, really, you know, the, the Philistines and Israel, they're, they're at odds. They always were. There's a battle that's coming up. There's battles that has already been. And God's people comes to pass. You can read back in that in that earlier in, in the thirteenth chapter where there was no smith in Israel. They didn't have a blacksmith there. Lest the Philistines said, lest the lest the uh, people of Israel would be able to have swords and spears. So they took uh, plows and hoes and, 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 and garden instruments of those natures down to the Philistines to be sharpened. And you can read that. They had files for the mattocks and the coulters and the forks and the axes. And, and they sharpened the goads and all. But they're getting ready for a battle. And it comes to pass on a certain day. Jonathan, the son of Saul, talks to his armor bearer. And he said, let's, uh, let's meet you get together and let's go over to the garrison of the Philistines. And, and what his mindset really was. If we stay right here where we're at. They've got us where they want us. We don't have any swords. We don't have any spears. All we've got is a sharpened pitchfork and a hoe and an axe. And, and we don't really have the weapons that we need. And we're situated between Bozes and Sinna. Two sharp rocks that were named. That lay between the passages. And Jonathan's mindset was this. If I stay here. Philistines are going to come and attack us and we're almost certainly going to die. There's no way out. If you study the geographical setting here and spend some time to dig into that, you'll find that it was a limited place that the people of Israel were in. They didn't have a lot of recourse here. There wasn't a lot of options available. You could sit still and die or we could squeeze between these passages. And when we get over to the Philistines garrison, it may be. Are you with me so far? It may be that the Lord will help us. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go over there, we might die. But we also might have victory. So between the passages here is the place that none of us like to have to stand. Nobody wants to be. Then this could very well be where the phrase came from that said they're between a rock and a hard place. There's a passage here with a sharp rock. There's a passage here with a sharp rock. And there's an army behind us that's almost certainly going to kill us. And, and we don't have any choice here. The only thing I can do is go between these passages and hope for the best. Because one thing's certain. I've got to do something. If I don't, it's certain that I'll die. So I want to preach to you this morning for just a few minutes if I can. I want to preach to you. You do have, you, 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 you've got to do something. You've got to do something. I know people that, my dad, for instance, let, let, let me go 
back to Father's Day. My dad is very decisionally challenged. I mean, deciding where to go out and eat can be a, a monumental task for my dad. He just sold his old tractor that he's had since I was in high school, retired it out of the ministry of the Richardson Farm, and he's getting ready to buy a new tractor. And I'm telling you, it has been a very monumental task. He doesn't take it lightly. He don't just pick red, green, or blue. He's going to know everything about that tractor and where it came from and who made the company and what the company made and where the tractor was made. And if it breaks, who's going to work on it and how easy is it going to be? I'm telling you, he gets serious about making a decision. He dated my mother for eight years before they got married. And, and I've always said I was an apostle born out of new season. Everybody tells me I'm older than I am. I should be 52 years old this morning. But instead of that, I'm just in my 40s, you know. If Dad would have married Mom when he should have married her, I'd be 57 years old today. But Dad doesn't take decisions lightly. And Jonathan didn't take the decision lightly. He understood that if he stays where he's at, they're going to die. If I go between these sharp rocks, I may die. They get wedged in there. When I get up to the Philistines' garrison, if I can take them by surprise, I may win the battle, but I have to do something. Pulled in to my dad and mom's the other day. I'm going to just throw my dad under the bus this morning on Father's Day, but he just suddenly made such a great example. I pulled in my mom and dad's house the other day with a load of lumber, and dad still didn't have a tractor. Sold his tractor and my cousin's little Tonka toy tractor that we've been using for standby it makes a great yard toy, but it's not much of a farm implement. Anyway, he had uh, run it out of diesel and then he run the battery down trying to crank on a 2016 model battery. And so dad didn't have anything. I told him, I said, you know, I don't really care if it's a John Deere, if it's a Mahindra, a Kubota. I don't care what the name of that thing is, but you've got to do something. Because I'm not unloading these trailer loads of lumber by hand. That's what I'm sure of. It's going to kill me. I'm going to be like Jonathan. If I stay here and unload this by hand, I'm going to die. You've got to do something. Dad's told me before, when I was pressuring him to make a decision, he said, don't stress me out. I said, Dad, you have to do something. He said, I know. I won't have to do it just yet. I can think about it. My cousin was working on something one day and Ben was helping him. It's been years and years ago. And they was getting ready to tear some stuff down at the house there, an old playhouse or something they was doing. And so Ben and Hunter, his cousin, got ready to do it. And, and, and my cousin, more like an uncle to him, he, they called him Uncle Jason. So, so Uncle Jason's getting ready to do it. And he said, boys, let's not do it just yet. He said, let's go to the house and eat sandwiches and think about it. So they went and ate sandwiches and thought about it. And after they thought about it a while, they said, let's just rest a little while. Rest our eyes and let's think about it. Then they went back down there and they stood and looked at it. And he said, let's think about it a little more. And after a while, the boys come and said, look, we've got to do something. Am I going to push it over with a tractor? Am I going to cut it down with a chainsaw? Am I going to dismantle it one more time? I don't know, but I've got to do something or nothing's going to get done. I'm telling you, decisions are not pleasant to make necessarily. But you have to make a decision. You can't just stay where you're at. I've heard folks say, well, I'm holding my own. I'm holding my own. They, they could have done that. But what they knew is, the Philistines have made sure we don't even have a blacksmith to make us a sword. Nor do we have a sword. So if something isn't done, they've got us in between this rock and this hard place. And we don't have any weapons. They're fixing to destroy us. we got to do something. One thing I'm certain about is you have to make a decision. There's a story told of a man who on his deathbed gave his friend a very expensive German-made pocket watch. It had a diamond set inside the watch. It was worth a lot of money. It was handcrafted by a, by a famous German watchmaker. He gave his friend this watch. He valued the watch. It was in a gold case. It had a diamond inside it. It meant something. Not only sentimentally, but financially it meant something. And it fell on a day that the watch was lost. His friend was gone. It meant something to him. He crawled through that house, looked high and low, and finally, underneath a dresser, at the back by the leg, there was that watch on the ground under there. He couldn't reach it. And right next to, stay with me a minute, Right next to that dresser was a chiffre. 
And the two legs were positioned one against the other. And the watch is wedged in between them. And right in behind that is the wall of the house. But right in front of that is a hole that goes down into the next story below us. And it falls into a crawl space where if it falls in that hole, it's never going to be found. The story went that the man said, I could move the dresser. I could move the ship rope. But if I move it one way, it's going to crush the watch. If I move it the other way, it'll fall in the hole. I might get it out of there. I may get it out in pieces, and at least I can hold the pieces of what my friend gave me. It's still worth something. I can touch it, and it's tangible. I might just slide them apart and get to it without it falling in the hole. I could just leave it there. And every time I want to see what time it is, I can go in there, crawl on my hands and knees, and look under the dresser, and shine a light up under there and see if I can see that watch. And when you come to my house to visit and have dinner... I could take you in there and crawl under and I could show you my expensive watch. And when the banker comes to do an appraisal on my assets, I could show him my watch under there. But I have to do something. Do I leave the watch there? Do I park the furniture and hope for the best? You say, I'm just not going to make a decision. I'll skip ahead in the story. We can't do that. You can't always avoid the Philistines in your life. You can't always avoid the sharp rock on this side, the sharp rock on that side, and the lack of weapons back here. There's times that life is going to put you between a rock and a hard place, and you're going to have to make a decision. It's not what you want to do, but you have to do something. When the Twin Towers were struck by those wicked men, those terrorists, those God haters, those American haters, those twin towers were struck. And those above the point of impact understood as that building began to burn, there ain't no way out of here. I can't bypass the burning plane. If I stay here, I'm going to burn alive. And many of them, the, 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 the fire began to go up and they began to burn. And I watched in horror as men and women jumped 40, 50, 60, 80, how many stories up, bailing out of that building to almost certain death. But there's a chance that an updraft may catch you and you may land on your feet and only get a broken ankle or a bruised heel. You might live. But if I stay in here, the building's coming down. If I stay in here, I'll burn a lot. It's not much of a choice, is it? And people ask me, so what if those people go to hell for committing suicide? Would it have been suicide if they stayed there and burned alive? Is it suicide to stay in a burning house when you know you're going to die? Is it suicide to jump out the window of a 70-story building and hope that you might live? It's not a decision any of us wants to have to face, but it's one that a whole lot of people had to face that morning on 9-11. They had to. They didn't want to. Not one of them got up and brushed their teeth, combed their hair, put their business suit on and went to the office thinking, I'm not going to decide today. I just can't decide. I mean, most of them were trying to decide where to eat for lunch or where to meet their companion after lunch and after, after work that day for a dinner day. But none of them went to work that morning trying to decide, do I dive out the window or do I burn alive? But they were faced with that decision. I'm telling you, life puts you between the passages. So I haven't always appreciated the, the sharp rocks on each side. I haven't always appreciated the Philistines. So but I gotta do something. You can't ignore the Philistines. You can't ignore the sharp rocks. I hope you're listening to me this morning. It's not pleasant. Do I leave the watch there? Do I get it? Do I try? Is a broke watch better than nothing? At least if I don't move the furniture, the watch is intact and I can go in there and look at it under that dresser. Every decision that life presents to you is not going to be the... You, you know, <laughs> I had a school teacher that always talked about no-brainers. You know, she, she was teaching us our math facts that year, the ones that were for that year of school. And she tells us, I want you, these should be no-brainers for you. Well, it might have been for her, but it wasn't for me. 
I mean, she throwed up a fraction on the board and a fraction over here and said reduce to the smallest form, simplify it down. And, uh, uh, that's supposed to be a no-brainer. I learned that last year, but I, it might have been for Mrs. Woodall, but it wasn't for me. It might have been a no-brainer for Daniel Webster, but it wasn't a no-brainer for me. There are decisions that are no-brainers. I mean, I didn't really put much thought into whether or not I was going to get dressed this morning. I knew when I woke up, I was not coming to church in my PJs. I didn't sit down and spend a great deal of time. I just simply opened the door where all my suits hang. You guys probably think I wear the same thing every Sunday, but there's about 20 of them hanging in there. And I said, black or navy, honey? And she said, navy. That's what we have this morning, navy. That's about how much thought I put into it. I decided whether or not to get a freshly ironed white shirt or just wore the one I preached in last Sunday. And so I wore the one I preached in last Sunday to lighten the laundry load because I care about the little red-headed woman back there. There's a no-brainer. Am I going to wear my Crocs and no socks or am I going to wear dress shoes? Well, that's a no-brainer. I've lost almost 40 pounds in the last few months. I put this suit on and I didn't have to think very hard about whether I put some suspenders on. I figured out real fast I was going to need them and we were going to have a bad situation when I got to feeling the Lord this morning. I just put them on. Did you really get up this morning and spend a great deal of time and brain cells on one another to wear your house coat or a church dress? No. <laughs> Did any of you this morning just pace the floor and wring your hands couldn't decide whether to drive a car to church this morning or just hoof it? I knew what I was going to do. But there are decisions that get dumped in our laps that life gives us that are not a no-brainer. We were in a cabinet shop at Brother Dickie Tolliver's one day and had the radio going and Dr. Laura Schlesinger was on, who I did not enjoy hearing, but I had been outvoted by all the other guys that enjoyed listening to her. I didn't want to hear her. I can't stand a mouthy woman, and I sure didn't want to have to willingly listen to one. But I had the power to turn her off. Dr. Laura Schlesinger was going at it, belittling people, making light of people's problems, and a man called in. He was crying over the phone. You tell immediately this was no joke. Tone of his voice. You know what I'm talking about when somebody calls you. You know, you, you can tell. My kids can call me and say, Dad, I just had a terrible wreck. Well, I know by the sound of your voice they hadn't had a terrible wreck. I can tell by the tone. I know. They had a terrible wreck. They wouldn't have. They just went, ah, when they called, you know. This guy's crying. He's hysterical. Dr. Laura tries to calm him down in a little bit. He says, my wife is in surgery. She's having a child. The baby, there was, I don't remember all the problems with the birth. But the doctor said that we either have to abort the baby in the womb and save your wife or risk losing them both. I can't imagine being in such a moment in life that I was in that spot and sought to Dr. Laura Schlesinger to tell me whether or not to kill my baby or my wife. I can't imagine. The man surely did not know about Jesus Christ or he would. I'm telling you, as he began to tell of her plight and his wife's possible death or the child's death or the death of both of them, I tell you, that's a decision that is a rock here, a rock here, no weapons here, and an army there. And there's really no good way to make the decision. Do I believe in abortion? That's a no-brainer. You know what I think about abortion. What do you do? I'll tell you what I did. I excused myself from the cabinet shop. Well, Brother Dick, your Brother Darren, whoever was out there, I said, I'll be right back. And I stepped around behind that shop and I began to pray for that man. Because he obviously didn't know God like we did. And he had to make a decision. I guarantee you when that guy got out of bed that morning, he didn't plan on by noon that day deciding whether to terminate my wife or terminate my child. No, he didn't, he didn't want to have to do that. Mr. Nancy didn't get up one day and say, you know what, I can't hardly wait. I hope I can get some kind of a life-threatening something going on and then decide whether to do nothing or take treatments or what kind of treatments to take or how much treatments to take. Those decisions are, are decisions nobody wants to have to make, but she had to make one. She second-guessed it like any of you would. 
And, and sometimes you don't know if you made the right decision. And, and if we don't know, and we don't know what the end of the story is. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave you hanging this morning. Because on that little story I told you about the German watch, <coughs> there was no end to it. That's how the story ended. We don't know what the guy did. I don't know whether to tell you the watch got crushed, fell in the hole, or stayed where it was. I don't know. That's how the story ended. We can go on and read the end of this story. And thank God we can. But I'm telling you, life presents some decisions to us. Paul got a decision one time. Philippians chapter 1, verse 23 and 4 said, I'm going to strike. I'm between two things. I got a desire to depart and be with Christ, comma, which is far better, but nevertheless, to abide with you in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul had already said, to be absent with this body is to be present with the Lord. Well, you would think then that since we all know that to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, why do we go to the doctor? Why do we take treatments? Because sometimes there's more to weigh out in the decision than just to be present with the Lord. Paul said, that's what I'd rather do. And that would be far better for me. But it's not the best thing for you that I'm writing to. Remember, when Paul waited out, he said, in perils of false brethren, in perils of the deep, in shipwrecks, in beatings, in scourgings, in fastings. I'm telling you, Paul had had a rough life. And he said, I can leave all of that and go there. That's a no-brainer. Which one of you this morning wouldn't just willingly say, yeah, Lord, take me. No more burdens. No more tears. No more old age frustrations. No more decisions to make. Take me. The problem is we look back at those around us and realize sometimes there's more to weigh in the decision than just what's best for me. Jonathan said, let's go over there. It may be that the Lord will help us. I didn't come to church this morning to tell you what to do. And that's one reason I put so much time in prayer in this message. Because I don't like to preach the open-ended message. I didn't come this morning with your answer. I just come to tell you you've got to do something. And like I said, it may not be for everybody, but it's for somebody. And it may be for somebody here, maybe for somebody that's going to hear it later. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you whether to stay where you're at and hope that your sharpened axe or hoe or goad or your pitchfork will defeat the enemy. I can't tell you that you can make it between those two sharp rocks in the passage and make it over there. I can't tell you you won't die on the trip. I can't tell you that you'll get there and God will move for you and all the Philistines will just fall into your hand. All I come to tell you this morning is you've got to do something. You're in the burning building today. Do you jump out and take your chances or do you stay there and die a certain death? It may be that God will move for us. I've been asked questions as a minister that I didn't have an answer for. I didn't even want to hear the question. I don't always know the answer. You don't always know the answer. Nobody goes through life just breezing through it. And no decision ever affects them. Just, woo, this is easy. I mean, why is everybody else complaining? Why are we singing songs like, don't worry about this heavy load I carry. Because it's a breeze over here where I'm at. You haven't lived that life. I haven't lived that life. Nobody else has lived that life either. But I'm telling you, you've got to do something. You can't just sit still and expect the decision to make itself. John Eubanks does any of you know him? Has any of you ever heard of John Eubanks? Has any of you ever heard about that biggest sweet gum tree in all of Amen River Swamp? Well, it's not a Bible story and it's not a trick question. John Eubanks and Marcel and Uncle Mercy went coon hunting. Yeah, I'm closing with a Jerry Clower illustration. You only hang on to yourself for a minute. I preached this, used this story one night at the Bible school, and before I got back to the trailer to change my clothes, a preacher from 10 to probably a thousand miles away at least called me and said, Did you really use a Jerry Clower illustration at the Bible school? I said, It's the best one I could think of. They went hunting, 
And John Eubanks took his shoes off and he clung up that sweet gum tree. You need me to do it all? And he clung on that sweet gum tree. He got up in that tree that they had the coon tree in. And in a little while, they heard him say, And they said, What's wrong, John? He said, Shoot up in here amongst us. He said, One of us got to have some relief. Is it the coon gotcha? Is it a taboo cat? Is it a snolly goster? Is it the booger man? I don't know. He said, Just shoot up in here. Well, I was going to have some relief. I'm telling you, life's going to put you between rocks and hard places where you feel just like John Eubanks. And you're just hot, and I wish somebody would pull a trigger on something. Shoot me or shoot whatever they say has got a hold of me because I can't stand this anymore. Decisions that have to be made are not always pleasant. And, and you say, well, preacher, you're up there in the suit and the white shirt with the Bible. You tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm over here trying to figure out what to do about my own stuff. There are times the Holy Ghost speaks to me and tells me what to tell folks. I've had the Holy Ghost speak to me and tell people not to have surgery. I've had the Holy Ghost speak to me and tell people not to get married after they'd already had the shower and sent the announcements out and they had to mail everything back. But the Holy Ghost don't always tell us what to do. Sometimes we're left at the mercy of our own devices. We read the Bible, we pray for wisdom, and we make the best decision we can. Sometimes the watch gets broke. Sometimes we survive the jump out of the tower. Sometimes we get out of the sweet gum tree. Sometimes we get out of it, but we're called to pieces. But what I felt like telling you, boy, I'm telling you, roll to me. I preached this to Brianna once or twice this week going down the highway. I told her, I said, I'm sorry, but when you ride along with the pastor and he's got something weighing on him, sometimes it just won't wait till Sunday. I slapped that console between us and I said, you got to do something. She said, well, Daddy, is it for me? I said, I don't know who it's for. I know the Lord moved on, but we got to do something. we got a sharp rock here, a sharp rock here, an army there, and no weapons. Divided. We don't know what to do. But all I know is I can't keep on like I'm going. i got to make a decision. Green tractor, red tractor, blue tractor, no tractor. Sell out and move to town. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I don't have your answer. I don't even know what your dilemma is. But I feel like telling you this morning that I know one that can help you make your decision. And even if you decide wrong, he can help you pick the pieces up of the wrong decision. If you've already made a decision that you know wasn't the right one, it doesn't necessarily spell the end for you. You go back to God and you tell Him, don't, don't, don't forget, Lord, that I'm human because you've been one too. And you've been here on this earth and you know what I'm dealing with. And I made a wrong decision. I turned left when I should have turned right. And God will help you. Baby, can you get another song? I mean, I told Brianna this week, she said, Daddy, you're really going to preach that message and just leave the whole church hanging not knowing what? I said, I don't know what to do. I said, there wasn't an end to those stories. I don't know what to tell them to do. I just know I've got to tell you you're going to have to make a decision because one thing I know, you're going to be put in places in your life that if you stay there, you're going to die. I know that. I know I can't just sit. I have to do something. Have you ever been in those situations? I've been in the hospitals. With folks, I've saw mothers, fathers, wives, husbands get up out of the chair and start pacing the hall in the hospital crying. I said, What are you doing? What do you need? I don't know, but I got to do something. I'm going, I've heard mama say I'm going stir crazy. I didn't know what stir crazy was the first time I ever heard it, but Sister Debbie, I still don't know exactly what stir crazy is, but I've waited a few times, I'm pretty sure. Sometimes you don't know what the decision that you need to make. You know I've got to do something. And I know this this morning, that it's not God's will for us to stumble in darkness. God will direct you. He said if any man or woman, any, mankind, human, lack wisdom, let him ask of the Father, that giveth unto all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, 
Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, tossed about driven. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. If you cry to God from an honest heart, tell him, I need help making this decision. God will help you make the decision. But you have to make one or the other. Let's stand this morning. I made a decision one night to serve the Lord. I made a decision to go to the altar. I made a decision to marry my wife. I made a decision. Many times over I've made them. And if life had a remote with it and a rewind, there's a whole bunch of decisions I'd redo. Married Sister Jennifer, I'd still do it. Get saved that night, I'd still do it. There's been a lot of other decisions along the way. There's been some vehicles I bought. I wish I'd have prayed more about. There's been some things I've done that I wish I'd have prayed more about. But I did the best I could. I was walking in all the light I had at the moment. I've done the very best I could. But it was a wrong decision. That's not the end of life. Sharp rocks. Between the passage. An army. I don't know what to do here. But i got to do something. Lord, I preached this message this morning not really knowing exactly who it's for. Not really knowing exactly what the decision needed to be made. I don't know exactly what the outcome needs to be. I don't know exactly who's facing what today. But I'm asking you, Lord, to give wisdom to those who need it. To give understanding and direction to those who need it. Shine the light on the path that's ahead of us, Lord, lest we fall into the abyss of darkness. If you leave us alone to make it through life by ourselves, God, we will fall. We will falter and we will not make it intact. By thy grace, Lord, by thy light, by trusting to the unseen hand, I know that you'll lead us on. God, I'm asking you, let this find its proper place in their heart. Those that are making decisions. I feel like saying this right here before we come and pray. Just try to follow the Lord this morning. It reached a place with my dad and his mother. Also reached a place with my wife's mother and her mother. A decision had to be made concerning a nursing home. No, when you're a child at Christmas, you're enjoying the cookies and the brownies and having a good time with mom or grandma or dad or whatever the case is. You're not checking out nursing homes. But my dad and his brothers, they weren't able to care for grandma. They had jobs and families. Grandma was a heavy woman. She was unable to get around. She could not do for herself. Her mind was gone. She ended up, had to be on a feeding tube. She was still alive, but she forgot how to swallow. Her mind didn't tell her body to eat anymore. And I remember my dad breaking out in hives till his lips turned completely inside out. Till his feet swelled with hives. Never had been that way before. Worrying. Am I doing right? I put mama in that home. They found the best home we could afford. It wasn't any skin off my nose. I, I was just a little boy. And I watched my daddy making that decision. I watched my mother-in-law grieve herself nearly to death and have to put her mother in a nursing home. My mother-in-law was an only child. She didn't have four or five siblings like dad did to vote on it and all work together. It was all on her. And I feel like telling her. This morning, I don't know why. I don't even know that applies probably to nobody here, but I just feel like telling you. God will lead you when it comes to those times. There's things in life like that that are hard decisions to make. No sharp rocks on either side of the passage. Gouge just as we go. And at best, we're going to get dirty if not broken. I know my dad went every day as he could to see his mother. Other brothers, aunts, they went. We went. And I was able to drive, I went on my own to see my grandmother. She never knew I was there, but I did. I knew. Felt like Brother Tracy Titus when he put his wife in the rest home. 
And he went every day. And a nurse said, Mr. Titus, I don't know why you bother. She doesn't know you. Brother Tracy smiled back with tears in his eyes and he said, but I still love her. There's decisions like that that's unpleasant. I remember getting to the place and Dad said, we got to do something. I remember it got to the place where my wife's grandmother would wander out in the dark alone at night, sometimes without proper clothes on in the cold winter. My mother-in-law finally said, we got to do something. It's not what we want to do. we got to do something. I want to tell you, I, I, I'm preaching this this morning with a heavy burden, knowing that I'm in the will of God preaching it, but I don't know who it's to or what it's about. And it's difficult for me to preach like that. But I want you to know with all the love I can tell you, God will help you when the decision has to be made. If you'll just rely on Him, He'll help you make it right. Do you believe that this morning? Praise God. Sing.